Welcome to Natural Habitat Adventures, Daily Dose of Nature. I'm your host, Sunny Vanderstar. Today's topic is Chasing the Monarch Migration, my first season guiding in the kingdom. And it will be presented by our fabulous NatHab expedition leader, Charlie Reinertson. Charlie, thank you so much for being here today. I will just say that visiting the monarchs was one of my favorite trips ever. So I can't wait to, to go back to uh, Mishawakan with you today. Let's go ahead and dive in. Great, thank you for that introduction and welcome everyone. I'm very excited to share with you uh, photos and, and uh, some conversation about uh, the recent trips down to the Kingdom of the Monarchs in Michoacan, Mexico. A uh, little bit about me, I'm a, an exped expedition leader for Natural Habitat Adventures. Uh, I'm also a photographer and a writer, uh, and I live in Saranac Lake, New York. I'm calling in and we've got about three feet of snow on the ground, and it's a pretty different scene from uh, the migration uh, location of the, of the monarch butterflies. Uh, so today's presentation, we're just going to dive into monarch ecology, and then we're going to take a look at the trip itinerary on NatHab's monarch adventures. And finally, we'll wrap up with a little conversation about the conservation of the monarch butterfly, and in particular, the migratory population of monarchs. Uh, so really, with everything about monarch butterflies, the more you learn about them, the more amazing they are. And uh, bizarre, really, at the end of the day. And what I find equally interesting about these uh, creatures is um, what we know about them through scientific research, as well as what we don't know. Uh, there are a lot of mysteries around this migration and how these butterflies navigate almost 2,800 miles each fall on a migration that they've never individually done before. Uh, so we'll talk a lot about how are they doing this incredible migration, um, at least what we know about it so far, and what are those areas that we're still researching and studying to try and understand a little bit more about these incredible creatures. So before we dive into Monarch Ecology 101, I'd love to share a video uh, that I took while I was down there this winter, um, this at the end of February and early March. And this video just places you in the forest with the monarch butterflies. And uh, we'll talk a lot about the monarch butterfly um, ecology throughout its whole life cycle. Uh, but in particular, we'll focus on this miraculous event where they are traveling to this one particular place uh, in the forest of the Oyamal fir trees in the high elevation mountains of Mexico. So this video is not going to have any sound. Uh, I'll post another version of this later this week that will have some sound, uh, but for the quality of the uh, recording and everything, we'll just have a, a one minute video here to try and place you in the trees, in the forest with these, with these butterflies. So here we go. Awesome. So in those final shots there, what we were looking at were actually millions of butterflies in, in, in a colony 
uh, El Rosario in particular, which, which we'll talk about. But in one place when you're standing in the forest, if you look around to all the butterflies that are clustered in the trees, and you can see between 80 million to 120 million is the current estimate of that location. Uh, so let's dive into this. Let's figure out what exactly is going on that is um, allowing all these butterflies to congregate in one place. And let's understand these creatures a little bit more so that we can uh, kind of get the context for how in heck that video is possible and how all of those monarchs can be in one place. And so the whole story is going to start with the egg. So on the left here, you're seeing a pencil for size reference, and then you're seeing an egg laid on a milkweed leaf, and then a really macro photography shot zoomed in on that egg. So the female butterfly will lay about 400 eggs exclusively on the milkweed plant. And that's a really special relationship that the monarch butterfly has. Um, where the entire larval stage of this insect is dependent on the milkweed species. Now, what makes milkweed unique is that it's a toxic plant. So most insects cannot feed on this because it creates this latex that contains what's called uh, cardinalides or cardiac glycosides, which are uh, a chemical that shuts down, if you really want to get into the nitty gritty of it, the sodium potassium pump. Uh, so it actually affects heart function and affects cellular function, the ability to move uh, um, these uh, potassium and sodium inside and out of the cell. And so it can be deadly uh, for animals that ingest this. But the monarch butterfly has evolved uh, to be able to handle that toxin and to the point where it relies exclusively on this plant and it also uses it to arm itself to make it poisonous for predators. Uh, so it builds up this toxin in its body and then the monarch butterfly and the caterpillar are sequestering that same cardiac glycosides. Um, and then they are, um, you know, if a predator like a bird were to eat them, it would then uh, throw up or, um, you know, have uh, be really sick or even die. Um, so in this initial life phase, the monarch butterfly, the female is flying around, lays eggs on the milkweed, and then the caterpillar hatches and its first job is to eat its own egg. So that egg is actually the easiest thing to digest because even though they've adapted to be able to eat this plant, it's still really toxic. And so they start by eating that eggshell and then they make their way to start eating the leaves. And the basic job of the larva or the caterpillar is to eat as much food as possible and to get as big as possible so that then it can set up the butterfly for success when it um, transforms from its into a chrysalis. So this caterpillar is an eating machine and there are amazing studies that are looking into how they're able to handle this toxin that the milkweed produces. And uh, only 10% of all eggs that are laid make it to being an adult. And so the, the ratio is not good. And the primary reason for that is that their primary food source, which is milkweed, is toxic. And so one of the first things you'll see on this previous image on this macroscopic image looking at the caterpillar eating its uh, its egg, you're seeing a lot of hairs on the surface of the leaves. So the first thing the caterpillar does is it mows down all of the hairs so that it can access the leaf. And the second thing it does is it goes to the pressure valve in the leaf and it creates a little incision that allows all the goo inside, the latex, which carries all the toxins, to ooze out. And, so, and then, it, so it's essentially draining a portion of the leaf, and then it goes in and starts feeding on that section of the leaf. And it'll do this repeatedly, drain all the latex and then eat the leaf, drain the latex and eat the leaf. And so that's one of the strategies that they have to be able to reduce how many toxins they're actually taking in. So another thing you're seeing here on the left is uh, the different stages within uh, the larva. Uh, which are the instars. So you have an egg, and then first instar, second, and in between each of those instars, 
the um, caterpillar is actually um, shedding its exoskeleton and then uh, emerging and, and going into another phase of growth. So again, it's an eating machine. It's doing everything it can to eat as much as it can and grow as fast as possible so that it can then form a chrysalis and go through the process of metamorphosis. And so in this process, once it's reached its maximum growth uh, and its, its final instar, it's going to use silk to attach itself to a branch and go into this classic J form here. And then it's gonna slough off its exoskeleton and emerge as a chrysalis. And inside there, there are all these amazing things that are happening where the cells are reorienting into the next form that they'll take as a butterfly. And the final image on the right here is the final form of the chrysalis that has this gold um, in different places that actually help it help it with camouflage uh, by kind of making it look like it's a water droplet. So we're moving through this life cycle, going from egg to caterpillar, chrysalis, and then to a adult butterfly. And so up until this point, the, the insect has been entirely reliant on this milkweed plant, and it's sequestering those toxins and making itself um, toxic to eat for predators. And it maintains that toxicity by continuing to sequester uh, that toxin in the adult form, in the butterfly form. And so just as the larva, its primary job was to eat and to grow, the primary job of the adult butterfly is to mate. And it also has the ability to drink nectar uh, to get energy. And so those are the two primary um, jobs of that adult form. So now we're gonna take a look at the distribution and evolution of the monarch butterfly. The monarch butterfly originally was a tropical species, and this will be really important to understanding the migration and what's happening there. Um, but the monarch butterfly is found all around the world. You see it in North America, you see it in Australia, Southeast Asia. And uh, this is really important because when we look at the endangered aspect of monarch butterflies, it's not the species itself, it's the actual phenomena that we have in North America of this migration. So a couple things to note here are that the monarch butterfly did evolve in the tropics and it depends on milkweed. That will become really important to understand this migration. The migratory populations, there are actually two of them and they're separated by the Rocky Mountains. So there is a small migration that happens in California. Um, and then there's the really big migration that we're gonna focus on in this talk uh, that's happening in the Eastern United States and into, into Canada. And all of those populations are funneling down to one particular spot in Mexico. So why migrate? One of the things that we noted just previously is that the monarch butterfly is a tropical species and it relies on milkweed. And so in the summer, milkweed started to proliferate through North America and monarch butterflies saw that food store source and started to follow it. And so the milkweed abundance in the summer in North America drove them to start looking further north um, the other thing that moved them away from Mexico is, or sorry, uh, another thing that drives them to go towards Mexico in the winter is cold intolerance. Because they're a tropical species, they didn't evolve uh, to be able to handle freezing, uh, really, really, really cold temperatures for sustained periods of time. And so they can't survive over the winter in North America in those colder climates. And so that's another reason why they migrate. And then another theory is parasite avoidance. So there are, even though they have that toxicity that they've built up, they have this orange coloring to be able to warn predators not to eat them. They do have some predators that we'll talk about in this talk. Um, and one of the big ones are parasitoids. So they actually are wasps um, and they, they lay their eggs inside the body of the caterpillar or the adult uh, butterfly and those that larva hatch and feed on the butterfly. Um, and they can they spread from one infected individual to another. Um, so they believe that by migrating, 
you're no longer concentrating your whole population in one place. So maybe it reduces the load of parasites in the overall population. So again, these are just theories because if we look at it, there's monarch butterflies all throughout the world, but this migration only happens here. And so scientists are continue, continuing to study this and try to understand why is this migration happening and how is it happening. But these are a few of the leading theories at the moment. So let's take a look at the migratory pathways. This graphic is really great. It shows the migra migratory population um, in California, um, where the wintering grounds are right along the Cal southern California coast. And then it also shows the larger migration that we're talking about today and that is from southern Canada all the way through the Midwest United States and eastern United States all the way down to this very particular spot in central Mexico. So this is the 2,800 mile migration that a single butterfly makes and we'll talk a little bit more about this. In the springtime those butterflies make the return trip from the overwintering grounds in the mountains to the north. And this graphic is really great because it's showing that as they move north, they're doing it through generations. So if you start in the wintering grounds about right now, the monarch butterflies are starting to think about flying north and they're going to fly into southern Texas and into this area uh, that's uh, noted in blue as generation one. Those butterflies will lay their eggs on, on milkweed and they'll those caterpillars will hatch and uh, then they'll feed and, and uh, become butterflies and then they'll fly further north and then that next generation will happen in the green area. They'll do the same thing and they'll fly further north and that next generation and in the yellow area in July and August and then finally up into southern Canada by generation four or five. And then something very particular happens. Uh, the season changes and the monarch butterflies are a little bit like a Mars rover. So if you can picture a Mars rover, it has sensors all over it detecting different things about the atmosphere and chemical composition of rocks. And the monarch butterfly is exactly like that. It's equipped with all of these sensors. And at a certain point in time, it's going to detect changes in temperature. It will start to detect that the sun is at a different angle in the sky throughout the day. And it will also detect plant senescence. So as the plant dies back, uh, it has a different chemical makeup and the butterflies and the caterpillars can actually taste that and detect that. And so these different factors are telling them that the season is changing and it actually triggers a change in the butterflies themselves. So here's another visualization of that Southern migration and what happens when all of those seasonal changes trigger them is that they enter what's called reproductive diapause. And this is an area that scientists are really trying to research because there's a lot of medical implications here. So in this life form, the adult butterflies, their reproductive organs are on pause. And then they're able to increase their fat storage and they live for up to seven months. If we go back to that life cycle, thinking about from egg to adult, their typical life cycle is about one to two months, depending on the temperature, um, the, just the ambient temperature during that lifespan. So there, if you look at the adult butterfly, they live for two to three weeks, and then they're extending that lifespan up to seven months to be able to make this migration. I'll say this a couple of times because it's so mind blowing. But one individual will make the flight all the way from southern Canada all the way down 2,800 miles over winter in the Transvolcanic Mountains in Mexico. And then that same individual is going to fly north into Texas and lay its eggs. At that point, it regains the ability to reproduce. And then that generational hop in that we looked at just in this slide starts to happen. So truly amazing and it's all triggered by these environmental changes that are happening in the fall um, that tell them it's time to start migrating south. The other thing to highlight here when we're looking at these generations is that 
the generation of butterfly that's making this incredible journey, nearly 3,000 miles, has never done this before because its great, 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 great relative um, is the one that was overwintering in Mexico. So how are they doing that? This is a huge area of research and one that's made a lot of strides in recent years to be able to understand how they're able to navigate to this very specific location in Mexico. So two of the tools that they're using is that they have a circadian clock. Uh, similar to you and me, uh, we have hormones that are regulated uh, by our circadian rhythms. And that's why we look at melatonin to help us sleep through the winter. So our bodies are responding to the amount of light in a given day, and that helps regulate hormones. It's the same in butterflies. So this circadian clock is able to tell them what time of day it is based on the position of the sun and how much light is happening uh, during the day. And then they have what's called an internal compass. And so this allows them to determine their position in relation to the sun. So they know what time of day it is and they know their position in relation to the sun. And that allows them to get a bearing to be able to uh, navigate to one particular place. There's another piece of the puzzle that's being researched and that is magnetic field detection. So scientists have found they know that there's a concentration of magnetite in their bodies and they believe that that the purpose of that is to help the butterflies be able to detect magnetic fields um, on earth from the south to the north pole and be able to orient in relation to that and that becomes particularly important because the wintering grounds of the monarch butterfly are in the transvolcanic belt so i'm just going to pop back to this other slide that shows a little bit more context. So the mon monarch wintering grounds right here in orange at the bottom of this uh, map are running east-west essentially, and that's the transvolcanic belt of mountains. And there's actually an anomaly there that disrupts um, the polar fields. And so scientists believe that the magnetite that's sequestered in uh, the body of the butterfly is helping them navigate using the polar fields. And as they get close, they're using that disruption of the polar fields to be able to hone in on the exact location. So those are a few of those kind of Mars rover uh, sensors that they're using. Um, and a final one, they have pretty bad eyesight. They have a lot of lenses in their eyes, but they have pretty bad eyesight. But scientists have shown that some of the mountain meadows are helping them hone in on the exact location um, where they roost. The final sense that they use, and this one's pretty amazing too, is their ability to, to detect chemicals called pheromones. So butterflies release pheromones. It's a chemical communication tool and they can detect them. And it's that scientists have shown that individual butterflies are returning to the exact tree that their ancestors lived on. Um, and they believe what's happening is that over time, those pheromones are gathering on that tree. And when the butterfly is coming in to get cl close enough into that area, um, that final way to navigate is by detecting pheromones of their relatives. So let's dive into the actual wintering grounds. These are the transvolcanic mountains in central Mexico. The monarch butterflies are seeking out a very particular climate, and it's at above, at or, at or above 10,000 feet in elevation, and they're seeking the Oyamel fir forests. Now, this migration was only discovered by science in 1975. Um, Dr. Burkhart Urquhart, uh, started the monarch tagging program. And uh, he and his wife um, had uh, worked on this. And, and that tagging program is essentially, if you look at the picture on the left, um, taking a sticker and putting it onto the wing of the butterfly in a way that would not hurt them and they'd be able to continue flying. And the idea was that if they tagged the butterfly in their summer grounds, 
that butterfly would fly south and then someone would find that same individual and record the number on that sticker and then it would allow them to um, identify where those butterflies are flying but we're talking about a migration that has on the low end 250 million and on the high end many 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 years ago up potentially a billion insects and so this tagging program started um, in the 1950s 1960s and it started to uncover where the butterflies were going to but it wasn't until citizen scientists uh, traveled around uh, Mexico that we actually discovered where these wintering grounds are located so let's take a look this is a map showing 14 um, historic hibernating colonies and uh, they're on this border between the state of Michoacan and the state of Mexico and each of these is a concentrated colony that butterflies return to and we're going to talk about two of these colonies in particular uh, that NATHAB visits on their trips this larger area is the butterfly biosphere reserve this yellow area and that is the designated area that's protected to protect the wintering grounds of the monarch butterfly and we'll touch on that a little bit more when we talk about the conservation of the species but for now let's talk about why are they going to this particular place and why are they spending their time there the Oyamel fir forest has a very specific climate because you're at 10,000 feet it stays pretty cold um, but because you're also close to the equator it doesn't get too cold so as we mentioned monarch butterflies are a tropical species and they are cold intolerant so they can't handle freezing temperatures for a really long period of time but in the winter their whole goal of this time is to save energy because they've gone into this reproductive pause they're not going to reproduce they're just trying to survive the winter until they can fly back north where there's a lot of food available in North America. Um, and so the Oyamel fir forest kind of checks a few boxes that it doesn't get incredibly harsh. It has these massive old growth trees that provide a little bit of a climate buffer to these insects and they can weather the winter here. So here's an image. All of these images of the wintering grounds are ones that I took this winter um, uh, while guiding with Natural Habitat Adventures. And here we're looking at the trunk of a tree that's completely covered in butterflies. And the, these trees, the Oyamel firs, the butterflies are not feeding on them. They're only seeking them out because they're the perfect habitat for them in the winter. So these big old growth trees have a really large diameter trunk and it actually holds heat overnight. It's the hot water bottle effect. So as those temperatures drop in the evenings, the trees actually retain heat for longer. So the butterflies are staying on those trees to be able to stay warmer overnight. And then the canopy of this very dense forest, dense mature forest um, helps to um, keep you know keep them dry um, and it also blocks wind so this forest is incredibly important to their ability to survive the winter because these at these elevations you can get down into freezing temperatures but because they're up in these trees it warms up during the day and it holds heat overnight and they're able to survive so what visitors see when they come to these areas uh really is dependent on the temperature because these insects are entirely driven their activities throughout the day are driven by the temperature and as i mentioned earlier their whole purpose of wintering in this area is to um you know slow down their metabolism to conserve energy they have those fat stores but they need to make sure those fat stores are going to last them to be able to get them back up into southern um, United States uh, to lay their eggs for that next generation. And so these butterflies, when they hit a certain temperature, they warm up and it allows them to fly. And so that's where you start to see different activities when you're in the colony themselves. When it's cold, they congregate in the branches 
and they swarm up like this um, into clusters in the trees. And um, the, the balance that they're doing, they're always trying to make sure that they're not burning too much energy. And so they are, um, when they warm up, when the sun starts to hit these clusters, they're making a decision of, if I stay in the sun for too long, I'm gonna get hot and then I need to actually do things physiologically to cool myself down. And so they're always kind of having this equation of, should I fly or should I not fly? And the other activity that they're doing uh, is actually seeking out nectar flowers uh, to be able to get a little bit more energy or water. So here you're seeing that sun hit those clusters of butterflies and this one is on a hotter day so the, the clusters are not as heavy and you're starting to see the branch structure. So they, uh, there are other types of trees in this forest but um, they really prefer this tree because of the structure of the branches. It really gives them a good uh, place to hold on. And as you can imagine, looking at these pictures, when people first discovered this and saw it for the first time, some people just thought that these were leaves in the trees. Um, and you really don't realize they're butterflies until they start to fly. And so this is a sunny and warm day in the in the colony and uh, you all of a sudden the trees just explode in rubber, rivers of butterflies and this is just a magical experience to be able to be in the middle of it and seeing all these layers of butterflies uh, we had guests describe it as being in a snow globe of of butterflies and it's truly amazing so here they are uh, getting nectar um, on their flight and fueling up and here they are getting water um, on a really warm day at the reserve. And once again, flying. So there are threats in this area. They do have predators that have figured out how to avoid their toxicity. So this butterfly here has a notch taken out of its wing. And that's uh, due to the one of two birds, either the black-headed grosbeak or the black-backed oriole. And these birds have different strategies for dealing with the toxin. So the black-headed grosbeak uh, will just eat the abdomen of the butterfly uh, because there's less of the toxin sequestered there. Whereas the black-backed oriole is going to slice open the abdomen and eat the insides because the out, outside the ex, exoskeleton actually sequesters a bit more of the toxin. And so those are two different strategies to kind of reduce their toxin loads. And then there's a third predator. Uh, the, uh, there's a mouse in this area that just eats the entire insect. And so as you can imagine, just looking at these clusters and the sheer numbers in one of these colonies, you can have as many as 100 million individuals. It's a huge food resource for these animals in the winter. So it's really helpful for them to be able to get to a place where they can feed on this. Um, scientists have been trying to study what's going on in those animals to be able to process that toxin. And some studies have shown that they're um, sodium potassium pump that we talked about earlier, the, the binding site where the cardiac glycoside would bind is less receptive. And so they're able to handle that toxin in their system. And there are other researchers who are suggesting that they actually gorge themselves and then they feel really sick for about a week and then they'll come back and gorge themselves again. So they're just kind of dealing with the ramifications of, of ingesting that toxin, which is kind of amazing too. So just going through here, as we get to the end of the season, of the end of the winter season, the monarch butterflies start to think about moving north. And as they start to think about that, they begin mating. And so the last week that we were there uh, in, in early March, there were butterflies mating all over the place. And so their mating behavior um, the male and the female kind of fly together and the male latches on with what's called claspers on the back of his abdomen and they fall to the forest floor and then the male flies with the female and the female tucks her wings um, and then they fly together, get up into a tree 
um, and that is their mating ritual. But what's really important about this is that the male is actually fueling the female's journey back north. So he's actually delivering not just sperm, but a spermatophore, which contains a ton of fat. And, and with that, the female is able to power her flight um, to be able to get back up into South Texas. So it's primarily the female that is making that journey, but there are some males that will also make that journey because the mating um, doesn't just happen in the overwintering grounds. It happens all the way through in this blue generation on the map. So that concludes kind of the overview of the biology. And now I'll just go through a really quick um, overview of the itinerary of the trip itself. And we'll wrap up with a couple of questions at the end. So the natural habitat uh, trips that go to the sanctuaries include the Kingdom of the Monarchs, and then there's also a photo trip. And they follow the same itinerary, but the focus um, goes from purely ecology and taking phone pictures to going out with bigger equipment and learning how to take um, incredible pictures of the monarch migration. So the trip starts in Mexico City. And um, on the first day, you make your way out to Ongungeo. And that's where a couple of the reserves are located that we visit. And we spend a few days there before making our way to Valle de Bravo. And we stay overnight. And then we make our way back to Mexico City. So on day one, that first drive is about a four-hour ride on a coach bus. And then we get out into our first visit for one of the sanctuaries. So this is kind of a three-part uh, journey. The first part is you hop in one of these covered trucks um, and you make a climb. Because remember, we're trying to get up to 10, 11,000 feet up into the mountains. And so these trucks are the first way that we make that climb. The second way is we hop on a horseback ride. And that's about a 45 minute journey further up into the mountains. And this, this horseback ride is, usually, is with a uh, horse owner. You can see there's a person in a red sweatshirt uh, walking alongside the horse. So it's a really controlled journey up into the mountains. And then the final step is hiking. And the hike can be really variable uh, depending on where the butterflies are located. So this first day up into El Rosario, El Rosario for many, many years has held about half of the migratory population. So they have between 80 and 120 million individuals at El Rosario. And so this is an incredible first day um, at El Rosario. On the left here, you're seeing the colony where within that frame is probably 60 million of those butterflies. And on the right, you're starting to see some uh, pretty emotional reactions from guests who are seeing this for the first time. So that night, uh, we stay in Angangeo. On the left is a view on the way back down in those covered trucks. And on the right is one of the places that we stay in Angangeo. Um, and these, this area has incredible food um, that's made, you know, grown locally and, and just really delicious meals and really cozy accommodations in this mountain town. On day two, we make a visit to Sierra Cinque, which is another of the uh, reserves very nearby, uh, about a 40 minute ride. And then we hop on horseback ride again. Uh, and then a hike to be able to get out to see um, the colonies themselves. What's interesting is each of these reserves are owned by families, and those those that family ownership is called an ajito. And um, these ajitos are cared for by the local people. And the conservation of this area has really been a collaboration between the ejidatarios, the owners, and the government and World Wildlife Fund. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but Sierra Cinque is really wonderful because it's a area that's just a really beautifully preserved old, old growth forest, which makes this a really special spot to visit. On that day, um, we have lunch 
on in the reserve at Sierra Chinqua. And it's a really beautiful location and really authentic food. And then we do a tour of Ungangeo. So Ungangeo is historically a mining town and a forestry town. And when the monarch migration was discovered by science in 1975, a few years later, Angangeo started to get into ecotourism. And that's a big part of why Natural Habitat Adventures stays in this town because it has really great access and the town has really rallied behind uh, this effort to conserve the butterfly and to use ecotourism as a mechanism to be able to help uh, fuel that conservation. So there's a lot to learn about Angangeo and its mining history and how it's transitioned into this uh, new economy. So that's our afternoon there. We stay in Angongeo that night. And then in the morning, we make our way back to El Rosario. And this is another opportunity, as we talked about what the butterflies are doing entirely depends on the temperature. And so on one visit to the sanctuary, it might be entirely different than the next visit, just based on wind or temperature or how sunny it is. Um, and so being able to go back to the same place again and being able to visit the sanctuaries three days in a row is a really great opportunity to give yourself the best chance to be able to see the different types of activities that the butterflies are doing um, because each one is amazing and mind blowing and it's uh, it's just a really nice opportunity to see it again. So here's just one of those uh, one of those images, and just the more you look, the more you see monarch butterflies everywhere. So just a few of those reactions. It's always amazing to see, you know, guides who have been doing this trip for 15 years. I I guided with Fernando. Uh, and he has been doing it for 15 years. Claudia has been doing it for many years. She's in the middle here. And no matter how many times you go back, it's just, there's just an emotional response. It's just pure joy or just taking in the, the beauty of it. And one of the really special things is that uh, these colonies are, and once you're in the colony itself, it's, you're supposed to be very quiet, almost silent. And so there's a lot of opportunity for each guest to really have their own experience in this place and be able to, you know, experience it at their own pace. And so after that last visit to El Rosario, uh, we make our way to Valle de Bravo, stay there overnight, and the next day we have a nice hike down to a waterfall and we explore the town and this area, and then we make our way back to Mexico City with a stop at Toluca to be able to see these incredible stained glass um, installation there. A uh, really amazing place that, um, and, and a fun opportunity to be able to add this on as we make our way back. So that's the full view, uh, making our way to the sanctuaries and then back. Um, and that last night we do a farewell dinner and make our way back to Mexico City. So this, um, this partnership between Natural Habitat Adventures and World Wildlife Fund is essential. And this, you know, this journey is funding the conservation that's making sure that this migration is going to be here for future generations. And so just to take a quick peek at the conservation status of the species, this is a scary chart. Um, but there's actually a silver lining. What you're looking at here is the area of the forest occupied by the monarch butterflies starting in 1994 and going to 2021. You're seeing a general trend down um, so that a lower area is occupied, um, but you're seeing a lot of change from year to year. And we could spend a lot of time just interpreting this graph, uh, but in uh, very recently, the mo migratory monarchs, so not the species, but just the phenomena of migra migrating um, was endangered, uh, listed as endangered as well. And so why is this happening? Why is that population trend going down so much? Um, initially, and for a lot of years, the large problem was in the wintering grounds, that there was a lot of 
a legal logging, even though this area was conserved. And through um, a lot of work with local communities and the Mexican government and World Wildlife Fund, there's been a massive movement to reduce that illegal logging and to the point where it's incredibly small uh, in this year. And they, there are all these in incredible programs, reforesting and planting seedlings and um, at the reserves themselves, this middle picture is actually from El Rosario of that ejido there actually working to replant these uh, OUML fir trees as well as other native trees. And as we talked about, all the ecotourism of the area is also feeding back into that conservation. So if we support the local communities, they're able to make a living and then reduce how much logging is happening in the area um, and be able to subsist on that um, ecotourism concept. And then also diversifying income sources. So there have been programs to actually grow mushrooms and farming, um, shift towards farming away from logging. And that's been another strategy to be able to uh, conserve the wintering grounds of the monarch butterfly. The other issue that, that the monarch butterflies face is as they migrate north, making sure that they have habitat to go to. And that's both the milkweed that we talked about that they're dependent on for the initial phase of their lives. And then also nectar plants that they rely on as they make their migration south as adults. And one of the big things that um, has impacted the migra migra migration is the presence of gly glyphosate, uh, which is used in farm, you know, farming corn and soybean um and it actually wipes out all plants that are not genetically modified to be able to handle that um, uh, herbicide so pesticides and herbicides are really having a huge impact on monarch butterflies and so there have been a lot of efforts to be able to curb that impact and one of them is through uh, designating i-35 as a monarch highway uh, i believe that was in 2015 and spreading awareness that we need to make sure that there's uh, milkweed throughout the habitat of the monarch butterfly. And so just taking a quick look at what you can do at home, um, you can plant native milkweed, you can provide nectar plants throughout the mig mig migration path, limit mowing, um, and support beneficial farming practices. And in addition to that, you can support monarch habitat conservation. So just to wrap things up, we'll take questions. I am really grateful for you attending and we breezed through some of those sections and there are a million things that we could talk about uh, with monarch butterflies. They're absolutely fascinating creatures and the more you learn about them, uh, the more you realize that they are uh, truly mir miraculous and that this migration is, is something worth protecting and, and worth uh, worth taking action for. Um, so if you would like to get in touch with me, please feel free. You can find me on Instagram at Two Line Studio uh, or shoot me an email. Uh, and I would love to turn it back over to Sunny for any questions that may have come through. Charlie, thank you so much. It was such a joy to see those pictures and be refreshed on all the science. And I'm really glad that you mentioned how wonderful the food is and the novelty of sitting silently in those forests that was just one of the most memorable and unexpected aspects of the trip for me that the silence and being surrounded by the butterflies was just unforgettable so thank you for bringing me back um we do have a bunch of questions so let's just jump in um any idea how the extremely wet winter along the California coast has affected the monarchs wintering there? That is a really good question. And I'm sure there are a lot of scientists who are working on answering that. I haven't read anything in particular. Um, I know that monarch butterflies, so Lepidoptera, they're in the family of, of butterflies. Lepis means scale. So they actually have these little scales on their wings and that helps them shed water. 
So what's really, really dangerous for butterflies is when they freeze and when they freeze wet and when they freeze for a prolonged period of time. A butterfly can survive sub 32 temps overnight, but they can't do that multiple nights in a row. And they also can't do that when they're wet. And so um, it's, I haven't read anything yet, but um, in the years in, in Mexico over winter, when it is a wet winter and also a cold winter, you can have massive die off in the population. And to try to keep the answer short, uh, but it brings up a really interesting point. We were talking about estimating the population of monarchs. Some people believe the migration could have had a billion individuals at one point. Right now, the population is healthy at about 250 million. And um, we would obviously like to see more, but it does, it is a fairly stable number. Um, but there was a year about 10, 15 years ago, um, where there was an incredibly harsh storm that killed millions of butterflies. Uh, but it also presented an opportunity to study the actual population of the monarch butterflies. So scientists went out and started to actually count the number of butterflies on the ground. And they had estimated the amount of butterflies in the trees that year. And once they counted what was on the ground, it was there, it was the same number that they had estimated that were in the trees. And when they looked up into the trees, they saw that they didn't look any different. <laughs> And so it was this amazing moment of them realizing that they had really underestimated the number of butterflies that they'd been counting year after year. So then from that year forward, they adjusted how many they were estimating the population to be. So a long-winded answer to your question, I'm not quite sure about what this winter will be and it, it's probably too soon to tell, but this also brings up an area of hope. If you think back to, if you look at a population graph of the monarch butterflies, it's up and down all over the place. And the monarch butterfly lays 400 eggs every, each individual lays 400 eggs. And if you multiply that by five generations in a summer, the population at large has this massive ability to rebound. So just as you can have really bad years that really negatively impact the population, you can have really good years that explode the population. So I think that's another area for hope that even if there's a bad year, you can have a rebound as long as enough time goes by and good conditions persist. Mm, incredibly interesting and complex. Yeah. Um, so here's a great question. Do the butterflies collide with people watching them or are they able to detect people and avoid them? Yeah, that actually brings up a really good point uh, that I missed is on those days where they're flying, you can hear them fly, um, which is incredible. And on the days that were really active, the butterflies are in your face. Like every once in a while, they'd fly right in front of my camera. Um, I never had them land on me. That just was just my experience. Some people were really patient and sat down in the sun and waited. And it just, it all depends on the temperature, on their activity. Um, the ejidatarios, the owners of the area, do a really good job of, of changing day to day and even throughout the day where you're allowed to be in relation to the colony. And so they'll put up little ropes to be able to keep you away from certain areas. So they're trying to keep you away from places where they're really, really thick. Um, and so, yes, they can land on you. Uh, yes, it can go that way. Um, and yeah, it's it's pretty amazing. Um, will any species of milkweed work for um, supporting the monarchs, or are there specific species that are best or recommended? That's a really great question. So, um, if you go to Monarch Watch um, and a number of different places, it is important to plant what's native to your area. Um, and part of the research that's going into this is that uh, in each species of milkweed has a different level of toxicity. And we talked about parasites and parasite loads. Um, a butterfly is, a monarch butterfly is always trying to, to decide how much of the toxin to take on. So the female will actually scratch a leaf to be able to detect how many, the concentration of chemicals in the leaf itself. Um, and then she will decide whether she's gonna lay her eggs there. 
and she's trying to find a sweet spot where there's enough toxins that her offspring will be toxic, but not too much to compromise the immune system. And so the, the tropical milkweed plant has a lot of toxins. And so if that's what they're feeding on, it can reduce their immune system and make them more susceptible to parasites. And so it, it you know, if there's a scale of good to best, it's good to plant milkweed, it's best to plant native local milkweed. And you can find that out from your nursery or from Monarch Watch or from various different websites. Hmm. All right, I think we have time for one more question. This is a very good one. Um, what is the level of physical difficulty, walking, climbing, altitude, um, required for this trip? That's a great question. Um, we had hikers of all abilities on these trips. Um, it can be strenuous. It, so the, the monarchs change where they are day to day, especially later in the season. And each year they're in a little bit of a different spot. Um, so the hike can be more or less strenuous depending on where they are. Um, and with that said, we also carry an oxygen tank just as a precaution or a, a, a way to make sure that uh, folks are able to breathe well at elevation because you are pretty high up. Um, the recommendation is to, you know, prep for the trip that you go on um, hikes or walks every day for a couple months leading up to the trip. Um, and then we have a number of, of, you know, drinking lots of water when you get there. And, and there, it's another reason why we have three days to visit the sanctuary, because if you happen to get altitude sickness or um, for whatever reason have to stay back, um, you're able to um, get out um at least one or two of the days uh, so it, it can be challenging for some and it depends on the time but the big thing is that we take it really slow we have two guides so one can go in front one can go in back and uh, a one group can take more time on their way up and um we had a number of guests where it was no problem for them and a number of guests where it was a big stretch and there was a uh, heavy lift, but everybody was smiling when we got to the top. So, mm. well, thank you again. That was a fabulous presentation. I will turn it back to you for any closing comments. Great. Well, thank you for spending this uh, hour with me, and I really appreciate your time. And um, whether you're able to be on a trip down to see the monarchs in the future or um, not you can take action and one of the big pieces that I'll, I'll put this slide up again to, to close um, another big piece is just sharing the story um, telling people about it if you see a monarch butterfly with a friend say oh did you know about the migration hey i you know i could tell you a couple things about it and just sharing that information and um, can go a long way to to gaining support uh, for protecting this and conserving this. And so I would say, um, you know, just get out and talk about butterflies and uh, enjoy seeing them as they, as they return this summer. Uh, and I hope, that, I hope that you took away a couple fun facts to share with your friends. <laughs> Absolutely. I wanna thank everybody who tuned in today. Please join us again tomorrow for our next Daily Dose of Nature. You can check out this week's lineup, including registration links, on our website at nathab.com forward slash webinars. We did record today's presentation, and we will have the replay available on our website soon. With that, I'll conclude the webinar. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thanks again, Charlie. Thank you.